morning's docket. <coughs> that is case number 108391. University of Kansas Hospital Authority et al., the, the Board of County Commissioners of the Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas et al., and Kansas Highway Patrol. Please support. Uh, my name is Dorinda J. Mitchell, Assistant Attorney General, Office of Kansas Attorney General Derek Schmidt, representing the state of Kansas for the Kansas Highway Patrol. I'd ask to reserve five minutes. Please. Five minutes is granted. There are four clarifications necessary at the outset of this case. Second, or first, uh, the document titled Police Hold is not a hold in any sense of the word. The term's a misnomer. It is, um, it, has, it is lamentable that the term has been misused to mean custody. A police hold is only a hospital form. It is not a court-ordered document or an arrest warrant. It is a permission slip required under HIPAA for the hospital to disclose to law enforcement what 45 CFR 164.512.F2 describes as, quote, limited information for identification and location purposes. It simply allows the hospital to tell law enforcement the location of an individual. It does not restrain the patient. Second, the second clarification is that Trooper Peters, the highway patrol officer involved in this case, did not in any way cause the injuries that resulted in Wayne Thomas's admission to KU Med Medical Center and there's nothing in the record to su suggest otherwise. This is not one of those high-speed uh, chase cases. In fact, the facts are that Wayne Thomas sped away when Trooper Peters was attempting to stop the car that Wayne Thomas was driving. The record shows only that Wayne Thomas alone caused the accident that resulted in the injuries. How is that relevant? I'm, the statute talks about custody. So I don't, I, I mean, I, so why does it matter who hurt him or if he hurt himself before he had to be taken to the hospital? I would argue it doesn't matter, but uh, opposing, uh, the opposing parties have argued in their brief that a separate statute that requires that, uh, that, um, that requires causation is applicable in this case. We argue that it is not. Uh, third, well, that's, could, go ahead. that's the only way that you could get uh, you could get the Kansas Highway Patrol liable and that's the only way to make any sense of the statute because under the Wesley holding the Kansas Highway Patrol is never going to take custody and you know uh, could never be liable under the Wesley holding could it? It, it could under a fact pattern when they have someone in custody and then determine that they're not going to uh, file charges so they don't take them then to uh, the county for um, booking and, and for um, um, prosecution. It, it could also occur under a fact pattern when they're holding a material witness in custody. So they could have people uh, under arrest or in custody uh, that are not uh, then subsequently taken to the county and booked. And can it happen in that period between turning over custody to the county? I mean, in this situation, from basically from the time that the highway, uh, highway patrolman arrested, handcuffed, and uh, until that person was delivered to the county, to the actually physically delivered to the county officers. It could if treatment were rendered during that period of custody. And isn't that what we have here? The highway patrolman had a person under arrest, delivered them to the hospital. No, he wasn't in his custody when the treatment was rendered. Um, um, and why wasn't he in custody when the treatment was rendered? Only because he was discharged from custody for the purposes of treatment? 
he was discharged from custody for the purposes of treatment, but he didn't meet what he did. The restraint did not meet the definition of custody. Uh, there was no restraint after Trooper Peters left the hospital. Does that matter? If the only reason the restraint was lifted was because of the need for medical services, doesn't the statute say you can't do that? That, that we ignore that that release from custody? No, the, the, the Court of Appeals found that Trooper Peters did not release him from custody uh, for the purpose of avoiding medical services or no. the cost of the medical services. That's what the statute requires. The, the what, would, purpose, what was the purpose then? The purpose was to go about his business and, and conduct business. Uh, it was in the ordinary course that he... But for the, hosp the, the hospital treatment, uh, he would have taken the prisoner to jail. Is that true? That is correct, Your Honor. So I agree with that. The only but for is the interruption of the intervention of the need for hospital treatment. Yes, but he might have also released him from custody uh, for other reasons because he wanted to go about his business and but, and but he wouldn't have had a need to go about his business if he'd gone directly to the jail. That's true. In this case, it, he would have taken him directly to jail. So In even fact, if we agree with you that they released him from custody at the point where the officer left the hospital, like uh, maybe, or when he released, took off the handcuffs so the nurses could examine him, d does that really help you? Because of the only intervening, in, intervening fact being that medical treatment was why he was released from custody. I do believe it helps us because the definition of custody requires restraint, and he was not in restraint during the time that he was being treated at the hospital. And uh, because of Wesley Medical Center, Wesley Medical Center also provides that it's the county or the, the subsequent booking um, jurisdiction that has responsibility let, for the... Let me ask the question this way. Um, tell me the reasons why the exception for hospital treatment doesn't apply. The well, in the first place, 2246.13 says that um, you can't release a person from custody merely to avoid the cost of necessary medical treatment. The cost, that's the issue. There, there is no finding of fact, and in fact, the Court of Appeals found that Trooper Peters wasn't trying to avoid the cost of medical services when he unhandcuffed uh, Wayne Thomas and left the hospital. If, if we agree with you, does that mean we need to remand for that factual finding? Can this case be decided without that issue being resolved? Yes, because Wesley Medical Center requires that the booking agency where he was subsequently uh, placed in where it was sudden, su uh, subsequently incarcerated applies. And he was subsequently well, incarcerated. They in would the only, that, that would only be if the Highway Patrol had released him for some other reason. Don't we still need to decide if it was really the Highway Patrol that kept custody? Or are you saying when they dropped him at the hospital that that automatically transferred yes. him to the county? Yes. As a factual matter, he was released from custody, and he no longer met the definition of custody when he when Trooper Peters unhandcuffed him and left the hospital because the definition of custody requires that actual physical restraint, and there was, that was no longer there. Well, let me get if if uh, Mr. Thomas after receiving treatment or sometime during his treatment, gets up and wants to leave. Well, weren't there instructions that the officer said, call me when you're done, I'm gonna come back and get him? He, he wasn't free just to get up and go, was he? There is, there is a record that the uh, KU Police Department was in uh, Wayne Thomas's room when uh, Trooper Peters went back to get him. 
But and, and it, it's clear that Trooper Peters was the one that went back to get him because that was his instructions. Correct. He said, when you're done, I'm coming back to get him. Let me know when you're done. Is, isn't that right? That's correct. So he was never free from arrest. I mean, he was always in custody of the highway patrol, wasn't he? Not within I mean, the definition of the statute. Because the statute is very specific that it requires that physical restraint. So he had left the hospital. And it is the practice in the hospital under these uh, misnamed police holds for the uh, hospital, if, the, if a police officer or uh, law enforcement officer isn't there, they do, they do go ahead and release them when they're finished with treatment. So it, it doesn't meet the actual terms of the statute. There's no physical custody. Uh, when the police officer isn't even there. <clears throat> Trooper Peters, no one from the highway patrol was in the hospital. So according to the statute, he did not have custody. He had left the hospital. Was, was there any agency that had custody of this gentleman? There's an indication in the record that the, that the um, KU police department had uh, had custody or had uh, at least an officer from the KU Police Department was in the room when Trooper Peters went to get him. So there's an indication that that, that was there. But the KU Police are, are not one of those in the list. I understand. Um, I'm just trying to find out if anyone or any agency had custody if, in your view, once the trooper unhandcuffed him and left, uh, you're saying the Highway Patrol did not, did anybody? The Highway Patrol did not. I know, but did anybody or any agency? Or it, it's possible that the KU Police Department had custody. Based on that one piece of information you just provided, which was that, that he was security person was in the room when the trooper came back. Yes. So is it your belief then that if the, this patient attempted to leave the hospital, that somebody from KU would have restrained him? I can't answer that question. I don't know. I don't have enough facts to answer that question. So as far as you are concerned, then, he may have been free to leave. He was not restrained by anybody once he was unhandcuffed. Trooper, Trooper P Peters, it's my recollection from his deposition, testified that he was free to leave. Ms. Mitchell? I, oh, excuse me. Finish? No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, at the outset of your remarks, you said you had four clarifications, yes. but I believe we interrupted you after two. Thank you. Could you maybe share uh, The third one we've, we've touched on, and that was that, that uh, Trooper Peters did not release Wayne Thomas from custody to avoid the cost of medical care, and that's the requirement of uh, the, the second statute. Can, that I, the, can I ask a question there? Sure. Is there affirmative evidence of that? Did he testify that was not his reason? Yes, I believe so. I believe that there was um, some information in his deposition about why he left. And did the district court make findings about that? I don't recall the district court's findings well Covering enough to that. be able to answer that question. Uh, the Counsel, um, I'd like to go back to my earlier question. I thought that I was done with you, but <laughs> like a clarification. Uh, Trooper Peters removed Mr. Thomas's handcuffs and then left. He removed then, the handcuffs so that, um, this is based on my recollection of the, the facts, he let, removed let, the... Let, let, me, let me go back to a, a little better timeline. There's this crash and Trooper Peters handcuffs Mr. Thomas, places him under arrest, takes him to the hospital, and it takes the handcuffs off, but is advised or tells the hospital when he is about to release, don't release him, but notify me. So he, the trooper was then notified when they were about to release him, then took him to jail. Is that right? I don't recall the... Um the statement don't release him i don't remember that anywhere in the record but i do recall that the record provided that 
Trooper Peters um, took him to after the accident because he he declined um, medical treatment from the ambulance. He was going to be taken by ambulance to the hospital, and he declined that treatment. And then well, when let me interrupt. I guess my point is he's handcuffed, placed under arrest, taken to the hospital. Yes. And then when he's released from the hospital, he's re-handcuffed and taken to jail. Correct. And so during the, that interim. Between the handcuffing episodes, the Highway Patrol did not have custody of him. As far as you know, there was no agency in custody. As far as we know and as far as the record presents, Trooper Peters wasn't even in the hospital. He left the hospital. Would it be typical law enforcement practice to unhandcuff someone, release them to the hospital, and then come back, re-handcuff them, and arrest them? I'm just trying to figure out. Yes. How, how that makes a lot of sense. Yes, that's, uh, there are instances where, where the highway patrol would sit there, and in fact, in the Wesley Medical Center case, um, they, they shared, law enforcement agencies shared custody and were guarding that person's door. So there are instances, and certainly when someone is in, incarcerated, prisoner is brought to a hospital, then they are actually there in the hospital. And if Mr. Peters, during his treatment or his stay, had just gotten out of bed and walked out, and Trooper Peters was advised of that, why, Certainly. Would, why would Trooper Peters, according to your testimony, or not your testimony, your comments, <laughs> your argument, what's the point in going out and re-handcuffing him and arrest him? Well, if, if he was not in custody the whole time. Well, he wasn't restrained. He wasn't physically restrained. And... What, what was the legal authority that the officer had, the trooper had when he came back to the hospital and handcuffed him and took him to the jail at that point? I believe by that time there had been um, some paperwork process that allowed him to then take him to the county jail. So when the trooper returned to pick him up, I still want you to give us our, your fourth clarification, <laughs> you. but I'm going to go ahead and ask you a follow-up question first. Um, at the time the trooper returned to the hospital, and picked up um, the gentleman, He did he say to him again, I'm arresting you on suspicion of X or whatever? Did he announce a new arrest, or does the record tell us? I don't believe the record tells us. Okay, I don't Thank recall you. anything like that in the record, but that leads into my fourth point that I wanted, How can my fourth fair, fair clarification. There is no requirement that a law enforcement officer unarrest an individual, as that term has been used by the plaintiffs, and that un unarrest concept is, is pure fiction inserted in this case by the plaintiffs. Um, it, it, it shouldn't be that healthcare providers seeking to cast off the patient's responsibility for payment can, could contrive the definition of custody or a law enforcement function. Uh, the statute at issue in this case, 2246.12, simply requires payment at the Medicaid rate by certain specified law enforcement agencies when a person is in custody of such agencies. That term custody is defined by statute in Chapter 22 to mean, quote, the restraint of a person pursuant to an arrest or the order of a court or magistrate. And according to Black's Law Dictionary, the plain and ordinary meaning of custody is that the person's freedom is, quote, directly controlled and limited. Um, the legislature's presumed to be consistent in its definitions and what a term is, when a term is defined elsewhere in statute, it's presumed that, that, let, that the legislature intended to apply that same def definition in both statutes. So it, it's our position that custody, contrary to the plaintiff's argument, and contrary to the statute, um, it, custody continues until an officer utters, um, does not, excuse me, custody does not continue uh, if some, um, unless some officer utters some magic phrase or condition as required by the plaintiffs. So custody is a factually based um, a 
term, and in this case, with Trooper Peters not exercising any control uh, over um, Wayne Thomas, we don't have the statutory definition of custody in this case. Are there any other questions? Do you know what he was arrested for at the scene of the accident? What was the charge? Um, I believe it was evading a police officer. Thank you. When you said there was some paperwork completed, what's, what is that? What paperwork was completed? I don't, I don't recall. I just remember in hearing some of the, uh, the, um, the tapes that uh, pertain to this, some of the evidence that there was um, some coordination back and forth between different law enforcement agencies. Any further questions? Any further presentation? No, thank you. Thank you, Council. Please, the court. I'm Lou Probasco, and I'll be splitting my time with uh, uh, the unified government. How much time are you? Seven and a half, Your Honor. Thank you. Excuse me. It seems that. We've concentrated a lot of time here today on the issue of whether the defendant, Mr. Thomas, was in custody. The trial court ruled um, uh, in their journal entry of May 7, 2012, that, the, uh, that Trooper Greg Peters determined the vehicle was speeding and pursued it, that the uh, driver of the speeding vehicle eventually crashed. Number three, the trooper arrested and handcuffed Thomas. And four, Trooper Peters drove Thomas to the University of Kansas Hospital, still handcuffed while nursing personnel advised uh, Peters that Thomas would be admitted. At that point is when Trooper Peters advised the nurses that he was putting Mr. Thomas on a police hold. The next day, he was notified and uh, came over that he was ready to be released, as is the practice with the police hold, 30 minutes before discharge. And he came over and uh, uh, handcuffed to him and took him to the Wyandotte County Jail. The facts of the case and the d deposition of Trooper uh, Peters clearly shows that Trooper Peters actually called the ambulance for the defendant, uh, for Mr. Thomas, and Mr. Thomas signed a written waiver that he didn't want to be taken away and that he was fine. And then he handcuffed him, put him in the back of his car, and started filling out paperwork to take him to the jail. And it's then when Mr. Tom, uh, Thomas asked, could he go to the hospital? This, I sometimes, I, I've been doing this now since my second year of law school. And we, ever since all these line of cases in Wesley and Dodge, and all we do is get into games on whether we're going to arrest the person, whether we're going to file charges for the, the county jail window or for the defendant that doesn't show up the next day in Shawnee County or for even ICE who refuses to pick them up on their detainer because nobody wants to pay the charges. And Wesley says if a charge is filed, we then, that's the entity that's liable. This case was so clear, I cannot believe that we're spending the time here today arguing custody. To me, it was very clear. Uh, he was handcuffed. He took him to the hospital. He did not um, uh, leave until he was advised that he was going to be admitted overnight. Um, Though our laws are clear when a sheriff or a jailer has to take custody, uh, possession of an inmate, there are no rules on the method in which they must guard, whether they have to stand outside a, ho a hospital room. But in if fact, we I disagree with your arguments that 
about uh, whether or not the statute changes Wesley. I think it's probably overly broad to say it overrules Wesley. But I, what it potentially does is insert another party into the payment stream, and that's the KHP. Uh, because of, of the, the wording of the statute, would we have to decide, if we, if we decide KHP is potentially liable if Thomas is in KHP's custody, don't we have to decide that question in order to determine if it's KHP or the county that's liable? You're speaking of 224612? Yeah. And that's where we ought to be putting our time, myself included, Your Honor. 224612 of our briefs talked about was a payment statute. That was the intent. That was the intent. But was that what was, a, I mean, did they do more than they intended to do <laughs> at, by the plain language of the statute? And now, how do we ignore that plain language? I believe that that's exactly what the Wesley Court had before it. If we all go back and reread Wesley Court, let's say we got 1930, says the city and the U.S. government are liable for, for the cost of a prisoner if, um, uh, if the, the sheriff is holding them. Cities traditionally didn't even have jails in our state, so we had a specific statute. The, uh, and that's what Wesley had before it. The statutes are just numerous. Um, we have statutes on detainers, statutes on extradition, statutes on um, fugitives from justice, all saying who is liable for the cost of that prisoner that's being held in the custody of the sheriff in the county jail. And we can't overlook that's exactly what Wesley was trying to do. Who's liable for the cost of this person that's being held? And, and so that, that's what um, Wesley had to decide. And if we all reread uh, Wesley, we'll go through and see as they addressed a number of those. Um, the, uh, I mean, the, like the neighboring county that has insufficient jail space. The judge can order it to the next closest county, but they're liable for the cost. Did 2246 change all of those statutes? Um, from the U.S. prisoner to the governor warrants to the parole violator, um, the fugitives from justice to, uh, I mean, it's just numerous, and that's what Wesley was trying to do. And, uh, and Wesley said, okay, we got to get this all together. Who's liable for the cost of medical treatment of a prisoner? And Dodge went on to say, being under guard, that's not the relevant issue. It's whether they were, whether they were going to be arrested and brought for the jail, but for the injuries. And I think that that's, that's clear cut here. And we need to look at the 4612. The whole purpose was simply to give the government, the law enforcement entities, the Medicaid rate. And the Medicaid rate, and the hospitals didn't object. Everybody thought it was a nice compromise. The public policy of our state was not that a hospital should bear the cost, but the public policy that it should be borne by the taxpayers. And by everyone agreeing and then adopting the Medicaid rate, which is almost always a significant loss. They, when they did that, I mean, it's about, by definition, 80% of the physical cost to provide the service. Uh, in this case, I believe KU's was about a 44%. Uh, every, every hospital in the state, except the one teaching hospital and some of the small <coughs> rural hospitals, are paid an average rate regardless of whether it's five days the person's in the hospital or 60. So it stopped this nonsense of serving the hospital with orders after the prisoner jumps down four floors in the federal courthouse building to his ultimate death, releasing him the next day. Um, this nonsense was going on so long, but we just got to counsel, Medicaid. Counsel, the yes. focus here has got to be on the Kansas Highway Patrol and on custody. Right. And if we are unable to find, um, as a matter of law, that this prisoner was still in custody of the highway patrol, I don't see anything in the district court order that addressed the 4613 contention that the reason he had, he undid the handcuffs was to avoid the, so that his employer wouldn't have to pay the bill. Uh, 
But isn't that in play then, and don't we have to remand to, because I didn't see anything in the, in the district court order that addressed the factual question as to the officer, uh, the trooper's intent in walking out of the hospital and leaving this guy in, from their perspective alone to do whatever he wanted to do. No, so what we, don't, it we don't have any factual findings on 4613, do we? No, and it requires notification to the medical provider, and there was never that notification. In fact, the opposite occurred. The police hold occurred. The police hold is in a HIPAA form. The, the police don't need HIPAA permission for their arrestee, and it, it's not a HIPAA form. I don't know where that creative logic has come up um, in the recent briefing. Uh, it's a police hold. It's exactly what it is, and it's been that way for many, many years. Isn't and that a question of fact, though? From I mean, from where we're sitting, <clears throat> there's never been one thing on HIPAA in this case till it started being done in the briefs just recently. I've never seen it. it it's not. A, it's a police hold. What it says, and that's what the district court found that they put him on a police hold. And uh, he only did that when he was, as the district court acknowledged, when he was advised that he was going to have to stay overnight. How, be but, but how can we find what police hold is or isn't? I think we take from, the logical, uh, common meaning. Uh, the district court judge ruled um, in uh, in the journal entry uh, that it was a police hold, and uh, the evidence bears that out. And even under Dodge. It, it doesn't matter that he isn't on under guard at that point in time. But I don't believe the unintended consequences of 4612 was to um, change all of these statutes. I think it would have to have been clear and it, um, look at the liability that it's going to put on every little county in the state if they no longer have the right to seek reimbursement if it's only based on physical custody. I think Wesley was talking about the legal custody. Any further questions? Thank you, Council. Thank you, Your Honor. My name is Colin Welsh, and I'm representing the Unified Government of Wyandotte County in Kansas City, Kansas. The Court of Appeals got it right. 224612 does supersede Wesley so far as determining the ex expense liability for medical costs. This is the proper conclusion. The statute's language is, am is unambiguous. The law is clear. Where a statute's language is clear and unambiguous, statutory interpretation ends there within. That's where the Court of Appeals appropriately ended their interpretation, where it should be ended. The Highway Patrol and KU are attempting to insert ambiguity where there simply is none. They are suggesting that we leapfrog over the plain language of the statute, ignore, ignore the basic canons of statutory interpretation, an attempt to divine legislative intent through the voice of the lobby. Shall be liable to pay and shall be the responsibility of our strong directives. No legislator reading the bill would have assumed that those directives were superfluous. If the holding in Wesley was so cherished, then the legislature could have codified that. They could have cut and pasted the language of that holding straight into 224612. 224612 dictates who pays and what they pay. Duty of care and its expense follows custody. Are we talking legal or physical custody? Well, here I think it's legal. And who had legal custody? If, in, in this case? In this case. I, I think that's cut and dried. I think the Highway Patrol did. But um, as I understood, Ms. Mitchell, at some point there was apparently an arrest warrant. I mean, paperwork. I am assuming that's an arrest warrant. You know. At that point, does it shift don't, to the county? I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, I don't remember anything in the record about this paperwork. I'm Hypothet sorry. Hypothetically. 
hypothetically. If charges are filed and an arrest warrants issued, who has legal custody? Uh, I still think that the Highway Patrol have custody and, until they would deliver. So that's physical custody, perhaps. You take so, me back, yes. So what are we doing? I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the conundrum, I think. Well, the I large think, part is how to define that custody. I think custody needs to be defined by 22-2209, um, which is restraint placed upon a person pursuant to an arrest. Um, or the order of a court or magistrate, a and judge so or magistrate. So, do you agree with the state on that regard that he was not in anyone's custody during the no, conversation? No, no. I, 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 well, there are lots of indicia that the court could use, um, but I feel that looking at looking at the facts here, that he was in the custody of the Highway Patrol. I think that um, the Dodge City decision is pretty on point with that. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, we've, we've covered the facts um, as far as this case is concerned. And like I said, I think it's cut and dried that the Highway Patrol had custody. The Unified Government is simply here to request that you affirm the decision of the Court of Appeals. Uh, the Court of Appeals properly interpreted and applied 224612, uh, as well as the definition of custody in 2209. Um, Court of Appeals got it right. Any questions? We have any more questions of counsel? No further presentation? No. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Reserve five minutes. Thank you. Justice Lukert, in response to your question, there is a finding of fact. I believe it's number eight in the Court of Appeals record that Thomas was charged in Wyandotte County District Court with eluding a police officer, a severity level nine personal felony. But do we know the date? And uh, the plaintiffs seem to concede that KSA 224612 is a statute that merely determines the rate to be applied when law enforcement is otherwise liable under other statutes. Uh, the unified government ignores the latter half of the sentence in KSA 224612. Uh, 224612 says a county, a city, a county or city, law enforcement agency, a county department of corrections or the Kansas Highway Patrol shall be liable to pay a health care provider for health care services rendered to persons in the custody of such agencies and at the risk of sounding as if I'm an infomercial, I have to say, but wait, there's more. There's not a period there. Um, the sentence goes on to say, the lesser of the actual amount billed by such health care provider or the Medicaid rate. It does not say that the Kansas Highway Patrol shall be liable, period, end of sentence. It doesn't say that. It says the Kansas Highway Patrol uh, among a list of other law enforcement agencies shall be liable at the lesser of the actual amount billed by such health care provider or the Medicaid rate. Counsel, the sin, before yes. you launched off on that, there was... No, except that according to the sequence uh, that was provided of those uncontroverted facts, um, it, was, it was after... Trooper Peters returned to the hospital the following day, handcuffed Thomas, and took him to the Wyandotte County Jail. So, in answer to your question, not specifically. Then that doesn't really help you from your earlier statement that there was some paperwork out there before the trooper showed up at the hospital to handcuff him and take him into custody again, under your version. Uh, so all we know is he came back, picked up the, the, Mr. Thomas, and uh, cuffed him, and then at some point later, charges were filed. I, I agree, Your Honor, but I, I don't think it hurts our argument either. What authority did the trooper have to take physical custody at that point unless the, unless the trooper believed that he had continuing custody as an arrest incident to the commission of the crime. 
Well, that's why I think that there was some other uh, activity or paperwork that that was involved in that. I, I, so you just think that's an unresolved question? I think that might be an unresolved question. But I, I don't agree that it was because he thought he had continuing custody because the statute, again, defining custody says that there has to be some actual physical restraint. And that was not, that, that did not exist. The sentence in, um, in um, the statute that we've talked about that does not include, does not conclude after the phrase shall be liable and goes on to talk about shall be liable at the rate um, and describes the rate um, has to be read then in, in, in accordance with the rules of statutory construction and those rules enunciated in Frick versus City of Salina provide that the precedential value of an existing case cannot be set aside unless that is the clear or stated purpose of the legislature. And the legislature uh, did not say that they were setting aside uh, Frick versus or Wesley Medical Center. They did not say or specify that that was their motive in adopting the rate statute. Counsel, let me turn your attention to a case that I think has been cited by both attorneys who are opposing you today. That's the Dodge or the Dodge yes. City case. Do you have any response to their? Uh, certainly, Your Honor. The Dodge, the Dodge case uh, it, it, uh, applies to uh, prisoners and incarcerated individuals. And the Highway Patrol wasn't in, involved in that case. So it's, it's in a posit, it's inapplicable. Uh, it doesn't apply. It 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 deals with uh, the um, the the duty of a, a jailer to um, continue to um, provide for the medical services and pay for those services. I understood their argument to be that the there don't need to be a physical guard there to establish custody. Did I misunderstand their position? No, the, I believe that there was some discussion about that in the Dodge case, but. Th but it also um, cannot be read to contradict the statute that clearly defines custody as requiring some physical restraint. Any more questions? Just, just one point of clarification before you sit down. We have three entities fighting over $23,000 in this case, and these are all publicly supported, taxpayer supported entities. Is that accurate? That is absolutely accurate. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Thank you, Council. Thank you. And thank you all for your arguments this morning. The court will take this matter under advisement.